Good afternoon, my name is Dave Norton from Discovering New England History, and we're gonna uh, start here with episode three. And basically it's, um, we're covering World War II, and the, um, going from Naples all the way through to Casino, and then all the way through to Rome. We're gonna cover the European conflict. And we're gonna pay a tribute here to, on this program to the 34th Infantry Division. So we'll go to the next slide. And the Seekonk veterans that were actually killed in action in the Italian campaign, Private Michaud, Private Berthiaume, Private Swenson, and Staff Sergeant Barron. And that's all a, they're all a part of this story. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, those of you that uh, live in Seekonk, there's a lot of memorials in all different, <laughs> just about every intersection here, and those are for all the soldiers and uh, Marines and servicemen that uh, actually um, were killed in action in various wars. And so I was interested in doing it on, on one of these just, just to get started here. And my daughter, um, her classmate at uh, Seekonk High School, um, <laughs> all of a sudden they were talking about it. And of course my daughter has my grandfather, my, actually my father, uh, World War II experience, and um, this is uh, Amanda Michaud, and that's her uncle. And all of a sudden, things started coming together. And this uh, stone monument right here, um, there she is. Um, and we're going to cover the uh, 34th Infantry Division. So we'll go to the next slide. And. Um, First of all, I just wanted to maybe hold this up here. This is a document I got. I'm trying to do some research on this stone. And this is something that you would get uh, from your veterans uh, office. It doesn't tell you too much. It tells you basically uh, when you enlisted. It tells you your, your birthday. It killed in action in Italy, 10th of January. Um, this is it. It's a good place to start. And uh, it was helpful. What it doesn't tell you is uh, all the information uh, what battles uh, your ancestor actually uh, fought in. And so I try to do some uh, research to uh, correct that. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, I found out that he was in the 34th uh, Infantry Division over in Italy. And um, I said, okay, let's, let's get going here. And basically, I took a look here. There's uh, General Mark Clark on the left on the bottom with General Ryder. General Ryder was in charge of the 31st, 34th Infantry Division. There's his picture over there on the right. And we'll go to the next slide. And we're going to talk about uh, Dunya Michaud. Now, it was interesting because uh, they don't say exactly which uh, unit he was in, but on his uh, stone where he's buried in, um, in uh, Attleboro, uh, they said he was on the 168th Regiment. And, of course, they were attached now to the 34th Infantry Division. So now I've got something to work with on trying to help their family out uh, to say exactly what he did. So we'll go to the next slide. And over in Italy, we told you to march from Naples up there, trying to get to Casino. And this is what they call Monte Pantano. And the 34th Infantry Division, their job was to capture all the Germans and put out all the uh, artillery pieces, machine gun nests, pillboxes, anything on here, because the march up to um, Casino has to go right through this mountain. And that's a picture of it today. And we'll go to the next slide. And here's a picture of the 34th. They're uh, all assembling together. You gotta remember, this was around uh, end of November and December. So a little bit of snow on the ground. Of course, the higher you go, the more snow there is. Here they are. They're marching towards Monte Pantano, Italy. And this all takes place in 1943. And we'll go to the next slide. Now they are uh, approaching the, uh, the base of the mountain. You can see them over there uh, very cautiously on the, uh, on the left. And on the right, I almost got the picture of the same place where this photograph was taken. This picture on the right was taken uh, very recently. So you get, get an idea somewhat of the terrain they had to go through. 
Now, in this time, of course, it was in the early winter, so you got rain, you got sleet, you got all kinds of problems. We'll go to the next slide. And they're halfway up the mountain, and you can see the slope on the mountain on the left. They're just uh, uh, <clears throat> trying to stop and take a break. And, of course, halfway up the mountain on, on the right there, you not too many, but you have a couple of buildings. And they have to get to the top of this mountain where all the uh, Germans are. And we'll go to the next slide. And now you can see the side of the mountain, scaling the mountain. There's a gentleman in a 31st, 34th Infantry Division over there on the right. And they had to go almost straight up. And you can imagine trying to do that in the rain and the sleet and everything else. And on the time, they were getting, uh, getting shot at, of course. We'll go to the next slide. And in order to, there's a picture of it on the, um, on the right of your screen. In order to get up their supplies up there, the only thing they can do that, there's no, uh, you go to a certain elevation and there's no, really no roads up there. So you have uh, mules and you can see the mules, what they have worked out. The only, that, that's the only thing they could do to get some of their supplies up there, such as ammunition and some food. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, the Germans prepared their defenses. And you can see on the left there, there's the, uh, the German Army uh, Panzer Division was up there. And they, they were on the top of the hill of this mountain here. And they were dug in with pillboxes. And uh, uh, it, it was a formidable defense. We'll go to the next slide. Now, in terms of the assault, getting near the top of the mountain, very difficult. So I just want to uh, give you an idea of what the uh, conditions are, the terrain. The high ridges, ragged, jagged peaks, and a perpendicular cliff they had to go up. And they didn't have any air and artillery support. And the reason, because over in Italy at that time of the year, uh, the winter weather is settling in, and you have uh, all kinds of fog and everything else. So you, re you really can't... Uh, have any uh, air support flying in a dense fog, and you really can't uh, call in any artillery as such because you really can't see anything up there. And the weather is rain, sleet, and cold they had to endure. Um, and the enemy, of course, we had, it was the German Panzer Grenadiers, and they were all, they had concrete bunkers that they dug into the side of the mountain, and that's what they had to, um, they had to eliminate. And the casualty rate was, um, was terrible. They, uh, they lost one soldier for every two yards that they gained. And medical tension was almost non-existent. So if a soldier got shot or got wounded, when they got up in the high elevation where the, uh, uh, the assault was, it would take them six hours to evacuate any soldier all the way down the mountain to an aid station at the base of the mountain. And that's hard to believe. Um, it, it, just, just incredible conditions that they had to fight, fight in. We'll go to the next slide. And that was the German 577th Grenadiers. And they were one, one of the best uh, equipped and experienced fighting units in the German army. And her whole idea was they're going to delay everything, stop the Fifth Army, delay, delay, so that the Gothic line, which we talked about before, Casino, could be adequately fortified and strengthened by bringing all the German army forces from, from uh, southern uh, France and uh, from other, other countries down. And really, they, they wanted to stop the advance right at what they call the Gothic line. So you go to the next slide. And the Germans were smart. And they had this here. I fortunately got a picture of it. They have these real small artillery pieces. It's certainly nothing like the uh, 105 howitzers and 155 howitzers American Army used. But they, it was perfect for the mountains because they, were, they were, um, had the firepower, yet they were small, and they could actually pull them up. And, and you can see on the, uh, the right there that uh, they were all set up ready to fire. 
It was a formidable defense. We'll go to the next slide. And you can see dug in positions they had. They controlled the mountain top. And we'll go to the next slide. And you can see right on the top of the mountain, you can see they had pillboxes made out of concrete. And you can see some of the, um, what we were up against. We'll go to the next slide. Now, this is one of the, actually one of the famous paintings of World War II. And the 168th, which uh, Private Michaud was in, and his commander was Captain uh, Butler. And uh, Butler was a tremendous officer. They got up near the top of the mountain, and they got overrun. And um, it, it was quite everything, down, right down to the basics, right down to hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that's an incredible picture on the top of Mont, the mountain there, Pantano. We'll go to the next slide. And I really have to read this because um, Captain Butler was awarded the um, Distinguished Service Cross. So you can look at it on the screen and I'll read it. Well, under heavy fire, Captain Butler personally led his company in an attack against the enemy. After gaining its first objective, the company was counterattacked by the enemy who broke through the company's right flank. And he was captain at the time. Captain Butler took one squad of a flank platoon, led his small group forward to stop the enemy, and then rallied his entire company to regain lost ground. That afternoon, the enemy attacked again. Captain Butler led elements of his company through heavy fire, and he actually led a bayonet charge against the enemy. His actions inspired his men to break up the attack. The following afternoon, the enemy assaulted again. Captain Butler made his way through heavy artillery, mortar, and small arms fire to each platoon to direct the defense. Although wounded during his action, he continued to lead his men until his company was relieved. And I did a uh, search on here. I said, well, I, I've got to get a uh, picture of him. And that's what I did. That's the picture there. And there's also a picture of the... Uh, Distinguished Service Cross that he uh, got. And he actually, in his career, actually ended up uh, as a general in the United States Army. And, uh, you know, the great part of that is that um, Private uh, Michaud was right with him during this uh, bayonet charge. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, they captured the mountain, and, of course, on the, on the top of the mountain, they... Um, uh, today they planted a, uh, a cross on it. And we'll go to the next slide. And they actually had a monument here at the top of the mountain. I don't know if you can read that, but I'll, I'll try to uh, read that for you. Uh, the plaque says, 34th U.S. Infantry Division, 168th Infantry Regiment, November 29th through December 4th, 1943. For such is the path of heroes, a terrain where only the brave would go, like a mountain pass, narrow and rugged, far removed from the peaceful valley below. And of course, that patch there on the uh, left is the 34th Infantry Division. And there's Private uh, Michaud there on the left. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, having done that, they scaled back down the mountain. And then they were give, <laughs> given their next objective, which was another mountaintop in San Vittori, Italy. And here's a picture I got of uh, San Vittori. A lot of these towns, they were actually called, uh, very small, they were called hamlets. So we'll go to the next slide. But you can see, once again, um, up the mountain we have to go. And of course, the Germans fortified the town. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, the Germans are great at planting mines, and there's two types of mines up on the uh, left, on the top. That's an anti personnel mine. If you step on that, the thing would bounce up about three feet and then just, uh, just blow up, and actually all your lower extremities would be shattered. And the one on the bottom, which is uh, the large uh, circular, it looks almost like a, uh, like a pan. That's for um, 
tanks and other armored vehicles. And that one there, once you hit, once you hit that uh, the top of it and run over that, and that'll detonate. And on the right shows the Germans there. They were, they mined the entire uh, all the mountain trails going up there. Go to the next slide. And here's the picture. These pictures are taken. Actually, I had to really scour the internet to find some all these pictures. Here we're going up the mountain, San Vittori. 34th Infantry Division. And we'll go to the next slide. And you can see on the left, you can see they stopped halfway up the mountain. You can see how steep it is, and they're just having a, having a lunch break, if you will. And on the right, you can see the problem is the litter, litter bearers had to carry all these soldiers all the way down the, all these, these uh, steep mountains. And there's your medics over there on the right. And then we'll go to the next slide. And there's a picture of San Vittorio. You can see on the right there, you, you can hardly even make it out there. You can see the, uh, the center of that picture, there's an open slit there. That's where it would have their uh, machine gun position, Germans' machine gun position. So they blended everything right into the side of the mountain. And we'll go to the next slide. And here's your uh, German machine gun position. It was very, very well defended. And once again, they called on the uh, 34th Infantry Division to climb up and assault the mountain. And we'll go to the next slide. And along the way, of course, uh, <coughs> where there were roads, they uh, actually took out a German tank. There's a German uh, Panther tank. There's a picture there. And we'll go to the next slide. And finally, San Vittorio is captured on January 6th. Now we're in the winter, 1944. And on the left, there's the picture of the town. And on the right, you can see it's almost right on the side of the right side of the mountain. You can see all of the uh, destruction, whatever, of the town. So we'll go to the next slide. And believe it or not, they've got to keep on going. On, this is protecting the right flank of the 5th Army on their march up the casino. And uh, Mark Clark uh, gave them the, um, in order to do that, the 34th Infantry Division had to go from mountain to mountain to mountain all the way up. Now this is the third mountain they had to scale. This is in Cervaro, Italy. And that's a picture today. You can see on top of uh, another mount, heavily defended by the Germans. And they, they mined all kinds of, whenever they could, they threw mines, anti-personnel mine, personnel mines in. Very defended, uh, well-defended position. So we'll go to the next slide. Up the mountain. So on the, uh, on the left there, whatever they could do, whether it's uh, pack mules or whatever they, that's the only, only way they could get up to the side of the mountain to get everything up there. And on the right is a uh, United States Army, it's the uh, mortars. They did have mortars, but that's the only uh, artillery they could actually use. So they did have mortars that they could set up and it could easily carry up uh, the side of the mountain. We'll go to the next slide. Now, Cervaro, Italy. You can see it over there in the side. And the entire town was uh, fortified with, uh, with, with the German, um, German army. And on the right is a great picture. You can see that it's, it's almost cut in the side of the mountain, uh, what they call a pillbox. You had to get through all these things. Get up as close as you can and uh, th throw grenades or, or explosive inside the opening in there blow it up and then go up to the next one. And you got to remember, you do, all, while you're doing this, uh, it's raining or it's snowing or it's sleeting and you're probably, uh, they say, in the average of 1,600 feet above sea level, the height of these mountains. It's uh, probably one of the uh, toughest assaults you can probably do against a defense on the top of a mountain where they can look down on you and see everything you're doing. 
And uh, we'll go to the next slide. And the mountain defenders, you can see on the uh, left again, once again, there are many, many uh, German machine guns firing down at you. And then at the same time, on the right, there's a uh, typical German sniper. And they had snipers all around. And you can see he's got the uh, telescopic sight on, picking off soldiers one at a time. And we'll go to the next slide. So they finally got the Severo the top of the mountain. You can see there's another pillbox they had to overcome. There's the, you can see the devastation there, probably from, from their mortars. And of course, these pictures are, uh, <laughs> back then it's all foggy and it's raining and you don't have clear pictures here to give an idea what they had to do. And you go to the next slide. And this is, this is a great picture. It's the top of Cervaro. There they are at the top of the mountain. And uh, it, it, it's, qu it's quite a feat and quite a determination to do this type of uh, an attack. And we'll go to the next slide. And they finally captured it on January 12th, 1944. You can see the, uh, the town on the left completely destroyed. And uh, on the right is another picture where they finally got uh, captured uh, at Cervaro. Now, when I went through the military records, um, I checked the enlistment date. I checked uh, the date uh, Private Michaud was actually um, killed in action. He was actually killed in action on uh, January 10th. So having said that, uh, those first mountain assaults, he definitely was, was part of. And the third mountain assault, uh, you can see there, they finally captured the mountain on uh, uh, the 12th of January, and his official killed in action date was the 10th of January. So he was actually, actually killed almost when he got to the top of the mountain. Go well, to the next slide. And on the top of the mountain, they have this uh, tribute there with the, with, the, um, with the bells. That's the top of the mountain. You can get an idea of the, the peaks they had overcome. So on January 10th, he was, he was uh, killed in action. And he was also awarded the uh, Purple Heart. He was only 19 years old at that time. And we'll go to the next slide. And the 34th Infantry Division, I looked up their record in, uh, in Europe in World War II, and their cal casualties are extremely heavy. Killed in action, uh, 3,737. Wounded in action, 14,165. Missing in, ac in action, 3,460. So they had tw tw uh, almost 22,000 casualties. And, the, and they had 10 medals of honor were awarded for valor. And they, gave, and they gave out because uh, <clears throat> as long as you were shot or, or wounded, you would qualify certainly for the uh, prestigious medal, the Purple Heart. They gave out 15,000 Purple Hearts in the Italian, uh, in this campaign. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, we, I wanted to find out exactly where he was buried. His body was brought back to the United States. And, uh, and of course, that was um, Amanda's uncle. And she took us to the cemetery at St. Stephen's Cemetery. It's actually right over the uh, border of uh, next to Seekonk, actually in Attleboro, Massachusetts. And there it is. That's where he's uh, actually buried. And uh, that nice separate plaque they put there on the right, that's the only identification that he had that said he was in the, uh, what regiment he was in. So I can, I, I can basically say that um, in my uh, limited research here, I um, <laughs> hopefully I helped the family out uh, <laughs> for, their, for their ancestor and, and putting everything together like that. And I think, uh, all the facts pretty much speak for themselves. So we'll go to the next slide. And once again, this is um, this is on the uh, monument there on the on the left. 
I know uh, everyone that's uh, been through Seekonk or drove through town has seen all these and um, probably never never stopped by. And, and, and the amazing thing is uh, the stories that they could tell are amazing. And of course, they never survived the war, so they couldn't tell first hands account to everyone. But each one of these stones um, it, it is tremendous stories that uh, could be lost in history if you don't take a moment and try to figure out exactly where they were and look up some of their operations that their particular regiment was in. And fortunately, I, I couldn't do anything with using the information I got from the vet, uh, veterans uh, office. But fortunately, someone put up this plaque next to, uh, on the right there. And he said uh, he was a private in 168th Infantry, World War II. And he was uh, killed in action January 10th, 1944. So without that information, I couldn't, could not have uh, traced uh, where his outfit was. And of course, there's his Purple Heart. And if you're on the corner of uh, Route 152 and Oak Hill Avenue, uh, take a moment. Uh, you can stop by and uh, now you know the, uh, the story behind that particular monument. And a couple of things I have here on my, on my desk, I just wanted to show you. Uh, over here, which I have, this is your typical light uh, backpack um, that they would have had when they uh, scaled the mountain. And of course, this is definitely a World War II helmet that I got. And you can see from all those photos, it's the same helmet that they wore. And this one here I actually have is the actual, um, I'm wearing, uh, <laughs> I'm wearing red to honor the, uh, the Red Bull Division, the 34th Infantry Division. And also this book here, Countdown to Casino, where I got a lot of this uh, information. So once again, I'm hoping that uh, w at least one of the stones in uh, Seekonk now has a story. <laughs> Maybe I'll be investigating some of the other stones in some future episode. Once again, Dave Norton, Discovering New England History. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>